Hi everyone, welcome to another exciting night at EVOS at New Paltz. Uh, appreciate everyone coming out. I'm Glenn Gare and I have the privilege of being director of the Evolutionary Studies Program and helping organize awesome events like tonight. Um, a couple of brief housekeeping kinds of things. Uh, we do have a reception after the talks. This will be held in the terrace. Um, there is free food and an opportunity to talk with each other about the ideas as well as our distinguished guest, Dr. Jeremy Jenko. Um, also, a uh, quick announcement that's going to make everyone proud, I think, is that one of our alumni, uh, William Borscher, you got to raise your hand there, William. He's an alumnus of biology and evolutionary studies. Um, he was just accepted into a PhD program in, I'm going to get this right, primary care and public health at Cambridge University. And for the record, that is where Charles Darwin went to college. So congratulations, William. Um, I am happy to be introducing our guest tonight, Dr. Natalie Jeremanjenko, um, who has one of the most impressive and interesting resumes that I have seen. And she does very cool work, and, and she'll be talking about that today. Um, she, has, she is a member of the uh, art faculty at New York University. She's director there of an envi uh, the Environmental Health Clinic, which essentially interfaces art and engineering and health um, to try to improve health-related outcomes uh, in a public kind of manner. Um, like I said, a wicked interesting background. She uh, has a PhD in neuroscience from Griffith University. That's in Australia. Um, she has a PhD in space systems engineering from Stanford, but she's a brain scientist and a rocket scientist. This is cool. Um, she has done a lot of work that I consider visionary in trying to take her understanding of the world and looking at the problems that we currently face as a whole and trying to figure out how can we make things better. And so with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeremy Jackson. Thank you. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, I will just go through a series of projects quite quickly, and I invite you to um, ask and interrupt uh, me for questions, or I'm very interested in hearing from you afterwards. Um, but what I'd like to do is um, introduce how I frame what I do, which is um, my lab and clinic at NYU I call the Environmental Health Clinic. Um, which is quite literally a, um, to twist the definition of health into an understanding of health as external and shared in the air quality in this room, in the food systems we depend on, in our shared environmental health versus the traditional medicalized idea of health, which is pharmaceuticalized, internal, atomized, genetically predisposed, this idea um, of treating illness as opposed to promoting health. So this um, redefinition of, um, this is actually about redefining environmental issues as health issues and health issues as environmental issues, right? Because, because if, we, um, if we take as our, um, well, let me just tell you a little bit more about the, uh, the health clinic. Um, it works just like a health clinic at a university. People who come to the clinic are called inpatients rather than patients because they're too impatient to wait for legislative change to address environmental issues. And you know, they walk out with not prescriptions for pharmaceuticals, but for things they can do to actually measurably improve their local environmental health. Um, and so um, maybe I'll just uh, go through, I'll come back to the rationale why, but it's got to do, and I just introduced this idea to, um, the pre-talk now, I'm going to be a little bit, what did I talk about? Um, uh, the, the idea of, I mean, we all know there's a climate crisis, right? We all know there's, there's um, 
environmental destabilization. Superstorm Sandy was a good reminder of that. You know, they, there's a lot of... Um, but I think, you know, the way that we've traditionally conceptualized this, um, particularly with global media attention to it, global biodiversity loss and global climate change, really makes us feel like, what can you do, right? We all know that we're using our shopping bags and changing our light bulbs. Necessary, but radically insufficient, right? So what, what can we do? That's the central crisis that I think overshadows the environmental crisis, is that this crisis of agency, what to do? What can we do? This exploration of, can I do anything? Do I matter? Can I count? Um, I've actually, um, I would call that reframing of health as an environmental issue, environmental issues as health issues, that's in the tradition of conceptual art, a uh, tradition called institutional critique. Institutional critique, I would argue, is the biggest intellectual contribution that contemporary conceptual art has given um, to us, and that it's not just about gestures, it's actually about reimagining our institutions, our museums, our uh, education. Um, and one of the other institutions that I've been working on a bit is, uh, well, is uh, zoos, zoological gardens, which I, I'll have you know, there's more people per annum who attend zoological gardens and aquariums than all professional sports involved, uh, uh, combined. Amazing. Um, anyway, they're powerful institutions that have, have uh, constrained how we think of biodiversity. Um, so we're reimagining that, and actually attending to non-humans has been very conceptually useful for me. So I've got a project called Ooze, which is zoo backwards and without cages, and it's specifically about promoting um, non-human habitat in urban contexts and the kind of interesting interactions. Um, and then the other uh, institutional critique is the pharmacy. Um, a pharmacy, in, spelt with an F, is... Um, actually about exploring food and food systems that uh, not just reduce food miles or reduce pesticide use or reduce petrochemical fertilizers in our um, agricultural production, but actually explores food and food systems that measurably increase biodiversity, improve air quality, water quality, in addition to producing delicious edibles. So um, I'll start off, I think, by showing you a few pharmacy projects. Every clinic has to have a pharmacy. Um, and so the, one of the projects that um, uh, I've based um, pharmacy on is these inexpensive ag bags I developed, um, which are made from a, a, a material you're familiar with called Tyvek. You know it from your FedEx envelopes or from the, you know, the wristbands that you get. Incredible tensile strength, right? But also very lightweight. And has these nanopores so it breathes. Um, that means that in the image I'm showing you, the rhizomic sphere of the soil, the oxygenated area of the soil, is actually all around that bag. Um, but essentially, it's a device, um, a very inexpensive way to turn any railing or parapet or double-hung window into arable territory. Right? Um, so uh, it's closed system. Um, it was the first thing that people ask who actually grow plants is, how does it drain? Um, this is closed system engineering, so a closed system. Um, it doesn't drain out. There's actually micro reservoirs inside, which are made from polyacrylamide gel, the same stuff that's in diapers, right? It expands to about 400 times its size. It's also your contact lenses are made of this. It holds water, and then when the osmotic pressure is sufficient, it re-releases that, um, that moisture back to the soil, so you don't get the big wet dry cycles uh, that stress plants. You, um, it's much more water conserving than, than um, when you have open systems. But the, the question is, what do you, well, one of the big critiques of urban agriculture, and I would argue that this enables kind of urban agriculture, right? One of the big critiques of urban ag agriculture is why? Why not just invest in the struggling rural communities that, you know, in the case of New York City, seven miles up the Hudson, Rockland County, where the family farms are selling out to 
fracking because they can't you know, make ends meet, right? Why not just invest in rural communities? And much of the urban agriculture movement has directly competed with rural agriculture, right? We're just growing the same stuff with preferential access to chefs and high-end market, preferential access to volunteers, lots of enthusiastic university students who want to get their hands dirty and have a go at urban agriculture. Every single one of my students wants to be a wants to be an urban farmer. Every single one, whether they're from sociology or from visual art, they all want to, you know, it's, it's I, I think, um, interesting. So the question is, what do you grow that isn't, that doesn't undermine our rural agricultural um, counterparts? And I would argue you grow things that are high nutrition value, high commercial value, and highly perishable, non-distributable goods, right? Um, what does that mean? Flowers. Uh, flowers are actually the most nutrient dense foods that we know of. And who likes flowers? Anybody here like flowers? <laughs> you know, um, you've got a whole lot of pollinators on your side too. <laughs> um, and in a pollinator crisis, actually being able to infloresce our um, uh, urban structures is a, is a good idea. Um, but the other thing I think to note is that um, the only technology that we have for improving urban air quality, the only proven technology to improve air quality is leaf area index, right? leaves. And so by um, this inexpensive way of, of promoting leaf area index with high shoot to root ratio plants, you can actually significantly affect air quality, I hope, in these, um, in actually there's a, there's a, this is the, I'm just trying to do this. This is a Photoshop version, actually. This one, sorry. <laughs> but this is what I'm working on, which is a large enough deploy that I hope to be able to measure the air quality improvements we might be able to promote. These are not Photoshops. These are all um, uh, versions of how I've been installing ag bags on existing structures in and around New York City. Um, again, to support pollinators, to um, improve air quality. We don't, there's no runoff, so there's no degradation of um, water quality. We're not running nutrients into um, the watershed. Um, and, um, and there's something interesting here too about, you'll see here, someone's writing on here, marking um, when something blooms or buds out, when an insect visits or when a bird visits. And I'll come back to that because that's actually become a really interesting part of the, of the project. Um, but what I wanted to say is that um, this is where it's, it's interesting um, to, in order to rethink, oh yeah, I have my eyes set on JFK. Wouldn't that be good <laughs> to influence that? Um, but this issue of, of uh, food and reinventing our food, I mean, this is something that we can and do and could think about. Um, and so um, in the idea, it's also, if you're interested in urban farming, it's much better to do it while you're repelling than <laughs> being on hands and knees um, as well. So, it's, um, so let me come back to the, the, uh, the how we eat edible flowers um, or why build this around edible flowers. Um, because most people just think of flowers as a way to garnish salads or cupcake, right? And not actually uh, as a food product. Um, so I've been exploring how we might use them in food products. Um, and I've been doing these manufactories, which are basically a mashup between an assembly line and a party, where I lay out um, how producing, in this case, open source cola, using a combination of the recipes. There's been seven leaks of the um, Coca-Cola recipe. And um, uh, Kate and Kale Brandon have um, open sourced it and put a GNU license on um, uh, open source cola cause, called Cube Cola. And so I use that as the basis for my cola manufacturing, um, where we have taken out the known car carcinogens from the Coca Cola recipe. And, you know, basically, if you're assembling this, <coughs> you can see, oh, in the cola syrup, the pre measured cola syrup, there's Neroli oil, lavender oil, lemon, lime, orange oil. That's pretty healthy, right? 
you can put in your own stevia or you can have it without sugar, right? It's not, and you can assemble it. And if, if you've assembled it, um, I also add these other benign ingredients, mind-altering ingredients, I, I like to call them. So um, uh, using the flowers, um, St. John's wort flowers in a tincture, um, makes, uh, you put two squirts of that in and you get a uh, happy cola. Um, so, uh, New England aster flowers, the uh, Iroquois used it, uh, New England aster flowers, as a love potion, and it's a powerful antiviral, so love cola is with um, that. There's various other uh, versions of this. Um, but the idea is very much to explore, to make food production radically transparent, right, which makes sense when it comes to food uh, production. Um, and um, to reinvent that sugary caffeinated substance we call cola in a way that we like. This is another um, food product called flower floss, um, which I should, this is a little bit of cultural translation. In Australia, we call it, um, it's not cotton candy, it's fairy floss. That's much nicer, isn't it? Yeah. And actually, in the UK, they call it cotton floss, right? But um, anyway, it's, uh, this is, actually using FLOSS as free Libra open source software movement, right? But I generalize it to free Libra open source systems, FLOSS. Um, and this is actually not isomalt. Uh, this is not sugar that you're seeing in this FLOSS. It's actually isomalt, which is the major ingredient in Metamucil, which those of you with sluggish guts would be <laughs> familiar with. Uh, it actually promotes biodiversity in your lower gut, right? It's used by diabetics as a sugar alternative. It's about two-thirds of sweet... Um, but it uh, it's, works like a fiber, um, and um, and it's optically clearer than sugar. So what we do is we um, uh, here we go. Um, we um, produce the uh, isomalt floss. We sprinkle it with um, bee pollen. We put in the edible flowers, and we stick a color-changing LED in the middle, and. Um, <laughs> and create a, um, uh, a food, the cultivation of which, with the edible flowers, of course, promotes biodiversity in your local urban environment and also promotes biodiversity in your lower gut um, so that you are producing a taste of a biodiverse future food that the aggregation of many food choices like this would, um, could significantly increase. Uh, biodiversity. But it was actually, the interesting thing that happened with these manufacturers, which has been fairly recent, is that, um, you know, you think you design a system very, it's just, you know, pre-measured squirts, you, the water, you know, you just move along and if you, you know, it's pretty straightforward. But people screwed it up. They kept spilling things and not squirting. I, it was amazing to me. It was very frustrating. And I realize the moral of that story is unskilled assembly line work is actually skilled, of course. Um, and that, that didn't work so well. Um, so I decided I needed some Oompa Loompas on this and have just formed um, a musical theater company called um, Child Labor. And actually the children now work in musical but very efficient assembly lines and assemble these colas and these food products to, um, to then the parents and the baffled audience can, um, can buy the foods that they see being produced, right? This is my new project, so anyone, so child labor um, uh, is an uh, interesting and fun um, new project. I, um, uh, similarly, um, uh, this actually also, used child labor. Um, this is a project, um, it's been, for a number of years, we've been, I've been figuring out how we can take, um, use this, the solar gain of buildings to our advantage. So these solar chimneys that actually, you put a bit of plastic on a building, the greenhouse effect you're familiar with, right? It heats up the air, the hot air rises, and then we can capture, we can pull in the um, air, the urban air that, um, that most, that most polluted bottom two to three feet. I call the stroller height effect. You know, the kid in the stroller sometimes has a thousand times worse air quality than the adult standing behind them, right? We're all there. Anyway, so this idea that we can pull up the air and then capture that 
um, with a filter at the top, um, in this case an electrostatic filter, that as the air comes through, you know, is, charges these ultrafine particles, the black carbon that changes the reflectance of the atmosphere and the color of snow, is a big coupling driver of climate destabilization, um, is the ultrafine particles that actually are so uh, small they enter into our, they go through our lungs and circulate in our blood system and transport all these other chemicals um, and pollutants with them. Um, so the idea is that we actually pull that up um, on a building, um, we collect it, and then we re-release that grime that we've collected and bind it into a pencil, the length of which measures the amount of air, um, the, the amount of grime, the amount of black carbon that we've been able to passively and inexpensively pull out of the, out of the air. So I've, I've been doing a few versions of this, um, and... Um, I originally did it with these uh, these filters, which you need too much air pressure, um, so I've moved to... But this is where, actually, this is the child labor that um, <laughs> was useful in this context as well. It's a tradition. Um, but a simple, uh, inexpensive way to address and to really make tangible, you know, what are, they, are these ultrafine particles? Where are they? How can we collect it? Does this make a dent? How, how much would we have to do to transform that into something that really is interesting or to try and address our urban air quality, right? Anybody here know somebody that has asthma? That's almost all of you. I mean, you're the generation with the highest asthma rate in history, so <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> um, anyway, um, uh, the Bronx ooze, I, as I mentioned before, um, has been an interesting project to really, uh, it's been very productive to take a non-human um, point of view of our urban systems. It's very productive to think like a salamander or, um, uh, and, um, and actually here, this, David Allison, who's a biostatistician at the University of Alabama, did this nice study that I really like. Um, he looked at records of 38 species of um, non-humans that live with humans in close association, feral animals like coyotes and um, wild cats and lab rats and lab animals and pets to see if the obesity epidemic was evident in any of these. Um, and can, can anyone guess how many of these species showed um, evidence of the obesity epidemic? Yes. So it's not just about whether or not you're going to the gym, right? <laughs> it's the environment is implicated. Um, and so, uh, you know, thinking with and listening to non-humans is productive. This is a um, communication technologies for birds that I developed a number of years ago, um, uh, which is a perch for urban birds. When they sit on it, um, they trigger a sound file that would say something like this. Now here's what you need to do. Go down there and buy some of those health food bars, the ones you call bird food, and bring it here and scatter it around. There's a good person. Okay. So um, I've set these up in a number of different ways where each perch has a different argument, right? My favorite was, um, you know, give me some of that. You know, it's, What about all the copyright dues from all those um, melodic resources, the cell phone ringtones and, you know... Um, but the birds actually had, uh, this was actually at the Whitney Museum, the, uh, the birds had a very different idea. About eight to one, they favored this perch with this argument. Tick, tick, tick. That's the sound of genetic mutations, of the avian flu becoming a deadly human flu. Do you know what slows it down? Healthy subpopulations of birds, increasing biodiversity generally. It is in your interests that I am healthy happy, well-fed. Hence, you could share some of your nutritional resources instead of monopolizing them. That is, share your lunch. Biology 101 from the pigeons. Um, but also, really a concrete... Um, you know, I don't think we have really adapted to this idea that our industrialized food systems have become 
you know, cauldrons of pathogenicity where viruses like swine flu or bird flu, um, when you put many organisms that are very genetically related without solar exposure or UV sterilization in stress conditions, you know, in a, in a different context, if, an, if a virus is too pathogenic, it won't, it'll kill the animal too quickly and it won't transmit, right? So it's these industrialized food systems that have produced this pathogenicity and we haven't yet designed as if we know that. Um, so I think birds can help us understand that. Um, in fact, understanding small adaptations in our urban infrastructure that can change biodiversity um, is, I think, perhaps one of the places we can have the most um, effect. And the butterfly bridge is one um, exploration of this. It's literally a bridge for butterflies where um, it's planted with butterfly attracting plants. So the butterflies bounce across the bridge instead of being smeared on your windscreen, right? Because um, one of the characteristics of urban biodiversity is that it's isolated patches, right? Uh, these fragmented little islands um, that if we can just join them together, will allow the kind of genetic flow through and, um, and to actually aggregate into a significant, you know, I, I think it's actually worth um, mentioning in 2010, which I think was biodiversity year by, um, by the UN, they did a study in Paris, um, the biggest citizen science study, um, where they asked people to, you know, to um, sort of like a big bio blitz counting butterflies and insects and pollinators in metropolitan Paris and compared this, um, the same to the um, rural agricultural area surrounding Paris. And they found a higher species number and higher populations in metropolitan Paris um, over the rural. And this is France, right? This is not large US monocultures. Um, so it's, uh, our urban context are these islands of biodiversity. And we can build and um, support that. So the, um, the, uh, we did actually, we got about 25 butterflies per hour, the butterfly bridge overpass to provide safe passage for, for butterflies. And the idea that we can um, stitch together this habitat and realize that, you know, nature is not in these little boxes we call parks, right, out there somewhere. It's, we're in it and we can, um, change it and adapt it. At one point, we were getting 30, 30 butterflies per hour, which was uh, pretty good. Similarly, the Salamander Superhighway, which is um, uh, uh, shown here, um, looks at how we can provide safe crossings for these migratory species. Um, salamanders, which for me, coming to this kind of verdant northeast area, you know, it was like seeing Santa's elves. Salamanders don't exist in Australia, right? They're, they're, um, and they're such an important part of this. You know, if you roll the big mass of these amphibians, salamanders and frogs into a ball, big fleshy ball, and roll the big fleshy ball of, of vertebrates, all things warm and hairy, all the deer and coyotes and, you know, um, rabbits and squirrels, um, little mice, the amphibian ball is almost twice the size of that. That's a lot of flesh to be, you know, under leaf litter and distributed around. And of course, it's the base of the ecosystem, because um, and because of that tremendous predatory pressure, the salamanders have a monopoly on this. You know, they've had to respond. They have a monopoly on the um, technology of limb regeneration. So, you know, if a hungry bird comes along and yanks a tail off. You know, which can be half their biomass, right? They can grow back another one. No problem, you know. Sort of like milking a cow, isn't it? Right? It's not about death, and it's an R strategy organism. It's not an. It's not a mammal that produces one offspring a year, if you're lucky. You know, they produce thousands um, of foamy spawn, right? Um, so that points us to a kind of natural product that I would call ethical meat, actually. Different from Google Goo, right? They funded the $32,000 burger, right? The lab-grown flesh and under the 
misappropriate, um, the inappropriate name of ethical meat. Right? Is it ethical to grow meat with high input cost less efficiently? And well, anyway, um, this is a. Um, <laughs> we'll come back to anybody interested in trying salamander cocktails can um, can talk to me. But so what was um, what we ha what in this case we. Um, looked at how we could promote um, the presence of, of these valuable um, species in an urban context and, of course, their migratory. Um, inside the, um, the superhighway is, uh, I actually have some other pictures, but inside the um, superhighway is a PIR sensor. So whenever a, a, a salamander goes through, it'll tweet, you know, hi, honey, I'm coming home. Or um, this was actually set up in, um, in Socrates, Sculpture Park. So the Socratic salamander would tweet important questions like, "What comes first, the salamander or the migration route?" Um, but oh yes, and they can of course learn to read. I would bet these. Um, this is the salamander superhighway on ramp. They have tremendously um, sensitive skin, right? So they can tell the difference in heat with the black arrow and the white. Um, and, and can potentially learn to read these traffic signs and translate that into, we'll see, <laughs> anyway. Um, so uh, this is another project in this, this was actually out of an exhibition at um, Socrates Sculpture Park called Civic Action where they asked a number of artists to develop urban plans for the area. And this is um, using uh, biochar which many of you would be familiar with, but those of you who aren't, is uh, a byproduct of a waste to energy process that produces a charcoal. They call it biochar because you want to put it in the, it's designed to be put in the soil. Um, this was a, an archeological technology that some civilization in the Amazonian um, basin would do this systematically. They would burn cellulosic material with no oxygen and they created the most fertile soil in the world called Loma Preta, right, this black, dark soil. Um, so this waste to energy process has a lot of interesting virtues. When you put it into the soil, it actually, um, well, it seems to, what it seems to do is create luxury housing developments for soil microbes so that they can break down a lot of the, you know, nutrients and release them to the plants or a lot of the, the, um, urban contaminants, which is what I found that we did. But this is what you can see here. Um, this is the area that we, um, and actually the color doesn't look great there, but we got about a 40% increase in, in growth and more um, diversity in the area that we had enriched with um, biochar. And the best thing about biochar is it sequesters carbon for about conservatively 5,000 years. Right. A forest, you sequester carbon for maybe a couple of hundred years. Um, so this is the time frame in which we should be thinking about it. But this was in Long Island City where I invited people to bring their cellulosic waste, right, their junk mail, their term papers, their dissertations. And we had a biochar barbecue where we incinerated this material. So it's a pyrolysis process. It doesn't produce CO2 and it doesn't produce... Uh, particulates, but it does produce a syn gas that um, you can use for cooking or in the biochar barbecue. And I also put on a, a salsa DJ, so we had a biochar cha, -cha and <laughs> um, and could then have a kind of convivial social context where we could discuss. Well, what does it take to recycle our paper, right? Where the diesel trucks come along, polluting our neighbourhood, and pick up this paper waste to recycle it. There's actually five subcontractors I counted, but you know it goes to one terminal and then it gets involved in handling this material, right? The embodied energy involved in trucking and it doesn't make any sense, right? It just doesn't make sense, and you pollute the environment while you're, you know. So this idea that we could actually locally use our waste streams to generate local energy needs to be thought about and discussed and explored. And so that is, of course, the reason for the bio-cha-cha. Um, and um, similarly, the Moth Cinema is a 
uh, project here where a silver screen hangs in the park. It's illuminated after dark at um, various pre-published screening times. Um, and of course, the light that illuminates the, the silver screen attracts moths. Does anybody here not know that moths are attracted to light? Why don't we design our urban lighting as if we know that, right? In this case, instead of, um, instead of being bedazzled and fried by the light, they, the moths find a moth garden that's filled with host plants and nectar plants and provisions so that they can play out their nightly dramas, their love triangles, their adventures, and cast dramatic shadows onto the screen um, and um, celebrate. I would argue, actually, display the um, success we, uh, our success in designing and supporting biodiversity. This was the first lunar moth seen in New York City in 40 years at the, um, the moth cinema in Socrates um, two years ago. Um, so the idea that we could and should have these kind of real-time displays of our biodiversity incorporated to, into other parks and other lighting systems is something I'm currently pursuing and makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but the other area that doesn't really make a lot of sense is the way that we do sports, right? Why is it that we, probably the, those green spaces that we call green spaces, that uh, soccer fields or football, you know, that, you know, are probably the most toxic, they're probably mm -hmm. worse than the, the roads, right, for the, all the nutrient runoff and pests, you know. They just, what are we thinking, right? Shouldn't we be designing sports that actually improve our health and our environmental health as opposed to degrading it? Um, so there's... Exploring sports has been an interesting area um, of research and very, um, I'm very interested in doing more of it, but this was one of the early sports I developed. Um, does anybody know who the strongest animal in the world is? Um, it's not the ant. Most people think, I don't know who the PR company was for ants, but um, it's actually the rhinoceros beetle or the stag beetle can lift about 36 times its own weight. Yeah, biomechanically impossible and extraordinary animals that, you know, why are they so strong? It's because they lift, you know, all that cellulosic waste, they, you know, all those old logs, they actually lift them up and aerate the, the, um, the soil to increase biodiversity. Um, incredibly important, they appear in every biome, yet they're sort of the, these unsung heroes of the underworld. Um, Figuring out how to relate to them in a different way has been um, an interesting exploration um, out of which the sport of rhinoceros beetle wrestling has, has emerged. So um, this is the head-mounted display that actually scales human forces to beetle scale and beetle forces to human scale. So it's a level playing field, if you will. Um, and then you enter into the... the, um, the um, you put on the head-mounted display. The visually, the, um, the size of the beetle is also amplified, similarly, like the mechanical advantage that we've used, and you wrestle the beetle. Um, so, um, of course, to have a sport like this, you would have to have rhinoceros beetles around. And um, can you imagine if this was a varsity sport? And actually, I offer scholarships to my program, to any rhinoceros beetle wrestling champions can come and study with me for, I, don't know, I haven't quite figured out the funding yet, but anyway, <laughs> that's the idea. Can you imagine if it were a varsity sport, we would have to have these, these um, organisms, right, happy and healthy, and they'd actually probably start escaping like Jurassic Park and churning up those, those soccer fields, those... Um, you know, increasing the biodiversity and uh, improving the environmental health. Um, exercise and sports training pro uh, projects, um, this exports or exercise program that the Environmental Health Clinic does, so you can come with as individuals or small groups and get a training program that not only improves your health, but the um, your local environmental health as well. So, for instance, this is 
again, in Long Island City in New York where um, um, you um, had a route. One of the favorite exercises is, because um, people, I think, are very interested in those six-packs, getting those, you know, that firm belly. So the best thing for core body conditioning is hula hooping. And um, we adapt our hula hoops so that we have, um, they're filled with wildflower seeds, New England um, wildflower seeds. So as you're, as you're um, building up your core muscles, you are also distributing perennial resources for valuable pollinators um, and various other exercises. So even boys can hula hoop when you give them, which for some reason they are unable to do. <laughs> but, um, uh, the, the tree office is um, a similar project. I have a, um, a strategy of using, having, holding meetings, um, doing consultations with uh, inpatients in interesting places. Um, so um, the tree office has been the m most recent field office of the environmental health clinic. But it's basically, it's not a tree house, it's a tree office, right? It's, it's a, a, um, an office and a tree. Right, with high-speed internet and locally generated power. And it works as a co-working space, so you can come and work there. So um, the, um, it also explores how we can build in with the kind of transparency and visual throughput that is um, characteristic of natural systems, right, instead of the enclosure. So this defines a space without enclosing it. Um, and it was the best office in New York City, I would say, um, the conceit of this is that it's owned and operated by the tree. The tree is the landlord. And if you're anybody got a co-working space or hot desking space, you pay your hot desking fees to the tree, right? Which um, is based on this idea of the tree that owns itself in Athens, Georgia. Has anybody visited the tree that owns itself? In... Um, it's a tourist attraction in, I think, auspiciously in Athens, Georgia, the American <laughs> version, not the actual seat of democracy. But um, in 1832, William Jackson decided that he loved this tree and he willed the, the tree to itself and the eight-foot um, by eight-foot plot of land around it. So the tree owned itself and its land. And uh, unfortunately, it died. And so the junior ladies... Um, gardening club came along in 1946 and planted a ski on an acorn, an acorn of that tree back on the, on the same plot. And so they tested heritability laws and the, the tree that owns itself continues to own itself. Right? It's an interesting concept and it's very different from the environmental services model of valuing uh, non-humans, right? So in New York City, the value of a tree for 80 years of, of a street tree, for 80 years of service, for all the habitat provisioning and shade and energy costs and stormwater retention and, you know, beautification and air quality improvements and um, carbon sequestering, for all the services that it provides, the value of that tree is $400 for its 80-year lifespan. You pay $400 a month for parking a car, right? That's just not consistent with my sense of value of a tree. It doesn't, and so this, yes, it provides environmental services, but as a paradigm for valuing natural um, systems, it's a very low, low paid service worker, right? And I think there's other ways to institutionalize the value of non-humans in our urban context. And this is actually much more the, the tree as landlord is consistent with the Bolivian Rights of Earth document, which claims that, of course, non-humans do have rights, and therefore you... Um, so extending that rights discourse to, to property rights, the tree that owns itself in Athens, Georgia, is just a peculiarity, but the, um, the tree that owns itself in Socrates Sculpture Park generates revenue, is landlord, you know, money speaks. Um, and it, it actually earns, earned $400 in, um, in a month of, um, of co-working space fees. So 
Um, we're hoping to build some more tree offices. And don't you need a tree office here? Does anybody need a tree? Okay, good. <laughs> um, this was another thing. Um, this is actually a, a very new project that I've just um, instigated, um, piloted last week. Um, but again, around promoting non-human um, presence. And I just wanted to read this out. The most of the world's biomass is composed of mutualists. Organisms in forests, meadows, and corals are all involved in symbiotic relationships. When I went through a biology, you know, I, I learned a lot about selective pressures. I learned a lot about um, evolutionary theory. But I didn't really realize that mutualism was the basis of the structure of our eco I don't think I'm alone in that. Right? I heard a lot about competitive predator prey, but not these. I didn't really hear much about. Um, so I've been developing this project to promote the non-humans in ooze, um, in the Bronx ooze. I've called it because I got a little bit of funding from Creative Capital to develop the Bronx ooze, um, as opposed to the Bronx Zoo, of course. Um, but in this case, we're um, promoting non-humans on bikes. Because one of the things that's happened in New York City and many other cities is they've had these bike projects that have come along, um, which are, are, you know, are fine. City bike things. Frankly, you know, for all the, for all the infrastructure savings, public transport savings, public health um, benefits, cities should be paying you to ride a bike. Right? They shouldn't be charging you to ride bikes. And perhaps the most in offensive things about these, you know, it costs about between five and eight thousand dollars a bike for cities to install these bike share programs. Right? Mainly, that's about the charging and these locking infrastructures. Which, anyway, there's all sorts of things that we could design that so much better. Um, and of course, bikes are. The ba I suppose the most offensive thing about these city bike prog prog uh, programs is that they introduce a kind of visual monoculture. Bikes are an icon, icon of independent, you know, self-directed, uh, diverse, you know, they're not corporate, all the same color, you know, corporate advertising conduits, right? They are something really important symbolically um, on the street. And so, um, so I've been thinking about that and developed this new project that I would in invite you to think about um, where we actually use Tyvek again to print on these non-human organisms like the Daphnia that are you know, so ubiquitous and uh, um, promote these non-human organisms. And the idea is that um, uh, these are a couple of my students. Um, they are currently have just had their bikes cross-dressed. Um, and they will, you know, as they're locking up their bike or unlocking it, people will say, you know, what's that? What's a Daphnia? I mean, what do you mean I drank a Daphnia? You know, you'll learn um, this sort of informal education about what these non-human organisms are. And I w actually think that this is a way that if cities aren't going to pay people to ride, I think with, um, as an advertising scheme with, you know, experimental theater groups and um, diverse dot orgs, um, this is a very inexpensive way to do uh, street advertising where they pay the environmental health clinic, you know, $50 a month. We spend $10 of that printing it up and cross-dressing your bike. The bike rider gets $40 a month. It doesn't take you very long to have paid for your bike and, and to produce more visual diversity in the street, right? So maybe the environmental health clinic will pay you to ride the bike um, in, if this goes well. Um, but in the in meantime, we're promoting um, these non-human organisms um, that are here and that we just often don't see. Um, that, what we do and don't see um, leads me to this project called One Trees, which is not one tree, it's actually uh, about a, th well, it was originally 6,000 genetically identical trees that was micro-propagated micro from a single bunch of adventitious tissue, which is the stem cells of, of, of plants, um, and grown in identical conditions um, as genetically identical 
clones. These, were, these clones were planted in pairs throughout the San Francisco Bay Area um, so that you could, over time, see the within pair difference and the between pair difference right, of these different. So I planted these about 12 years ago um, and have since been looking and monitoring them. These are the pair at Warm Water Cove. Remember, these are genetically identical in pretty much identical environmental conditions. And look at the divergence. Right? Um, this pair is pretty interesting on Valencia and 22nd. This is probably the biggest divergence. I've got some new pictures of it. I mean, one's got a tree caliper size like this, and one's got a caliper size like this, right? Planted ex genetically identical, planted at <laughs> exactly the same time, 15 feet from each other, same solar exposure. What's going on? And I think this has been an interesting, it's obviously looking at how our genes are called a code of life. Do genes determine how things look? You know, with clones, we would think in the same environmental conditions, we would think they would look the same. But what's been interesting about this, um, this pair, I'll, t I'll tell you a little story about, um, I was coming to see these, these trees um, a lot, and whenever I'm in San Francisco, I, I go there and one day this construction worker had seen me come to, to look at these trees said to me, what are you doing? <laughs> what is it about these trees? And I explained the project to him and, and, um, and uh, said, you know, they've diverged. I've looked at, I thought that maybe it was the, that the roots got into stormwater drain or into the, um, into the water mains um, and that one got water and the other one didn't. And, but then I found out that in fact in funny thing about San Francisco and seismic San Francisco, they use terracotta water mains, so they're all cracked and they're all subsidizing the entire urban forest, which is why <laughs> all the trees are growing very well. But, so it wasn't that one got in there or not. I, you know, I've looked on um, wipes to look at particular accumulation on, on one of the trees versus the other. I've done the solar studies. I've, done, you know, I've talked to a lot of people about how and why these, you know, the essential question of this project, why do the trees look different? Right. And um, he looked at me as if I was stupid and said, well, it's obvious. I said, what do you mean it's obvious? <laughs> he said, well, look, at the, look behind those trees. And I looked behind. And one behind the smaller tree is a 1950s kind of, it's actually an art gallery. And behind the larger tree is a Victorian um, house. Um, you know, the painted lady of the San Francisco fame. And um, I said, okay, <laughs> that doesn't seem obvious to me. What does that mean? And he said, well, between those two was the 1901 earthquake, right? And I said, okay. <laughs> you know, by this time he thought I was just totally stupid. Right? <laughs> and he um, then patiently explained to me that, you know, earthquake, that means building code changed, that means foundations changed, that means that, you know, the smaller one is a big foundation that's probably like a massive bonsai, it's limiting the root access, whereas the Victorian, the roots probably go all the way under and have a lot more access to nutrients. And what was interesting about that interaction, it's not that I was stupid, but just that, <laughs> that, um, that it requires the, you know, the irreducible complexity of our urban ecosystems requires the very different expertises and point of views of a construction worker who really, I've, you know, I've spoken to a lot of arborists and plant scientists about this, but it was the construction worker who made sense of this particular pair for me. And I think that's actually the lesson about distributed intelligence and how we can reimagine and redesign our relationship to natural systems by using the expertise not of any one discipline or not even many disciplines, but the very particularity of, of each one of us. And that's the power of distributed intelligence that I think is, um, is important. And I'll introduce this Muscle Choir project, um, which is, a, again, a current project that's based on these um, heroic organisms, the blue mussels, uh, which are the heavy lifters of water quality um, they filter about, you know, you know, this is like the ants and the, the rhinoceros beetle. Oysters, oyster, oyster texture, you've probably heard about um, the heroics of oysters for cleaning up water quality. Mussels filter four times as much water per organism as oysters. 
right? They live for up to 80 years. Oysters live for about 17 years, right? They, they, anyway, these guys are, are where it's at when it comes to um, reintegrating them into our urban um, systems to take advantage of their natural talents. Um, so I've been building this muscle choir, which is based on these organisms. It's integrated into this 15 feet of reconstructed shoreline. The only 15 feet of reconstructed shoreline in all of Manhattan Island is here. And the mussels are equipped with, um, I've super glued on a magnet and a Hall effect sensor, so I can tell when they open and close. When they're opening and closing tells us a lot about water quality, right? If they're clamped shut and they're not, um, they're not saying anything. It's not, um, this is a prototype that we did. Um, so I take that opening and closing when they're open mouthed and singing. Uh, well, I have them sing. I translate that input into song, hence the muscle choir. So, uh, what do muscles sing? Um, that's a, a good question. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer to I'm half crazy, all for the... Um, she or he or it, it would sing you this as well. Um, Hal, in 2001, sang this. This was the first computer synthesized voice, um, and it sang this song, which is why it's a trope of, or an icon of, artificial intelligence. Right. Um, actually, um, uh, Aaron Coblin came along and did... Um, um, not a bicycle built for two, which is the name of this song, but a bicycle built for 2000 using Amazon's Mechanical Turk to represent distributed intelligence. So, of distributed intelligence, right? I think we're, I don't know how many of you work at Amazon's Mechanical Turk for very low, for almost no money for doing dumb tasks that you don't really know what they're about, right? This is not how we can take advantage of the diversity of human intelligence. So instead of uh, Bicycle Built for 2000, the Muscle Choir, their first hit single, which hasn't really hit yet, but I'm hoping it will, is a, a bicycle built for too many, um, in which this is an early prototype in the Venice Lagoon, um, which they sing a version of, oh, where's the sound? Oh, it's disappeared. I'm sorry. Okay, you'll have to... I'll have to send you the, <laughs> the hit single of their bicycle built for too many. Oh, damn, sorry. Um, this is actually uh, a, uh, alongside a, well, let me tell you, the reason why I'm using the muscle choir to sing this song is not to actually iconify an artificial intelligence or distributed intelligence, but something I'd like to call natural intelligence that uses the actual responsiveness, the biologically meaningful response of the muscles opening and closing to represent water quality, right? Which I would argue is a much better representation, much more meaningful representation than the turbidity pH, you know, the normal battery of um, public data sets on water quality. And what do they mean, right? Um, I think the presence of organisms is a great way to make sense of the health of an ecosystem. And so that's what this um, installation, which is beside the muscle choir, um, fingers crossed, um, by this summer, um, is an amphibious architecture array, which is buoys that light up when fish swim underneath. So a low resolution display of fish presence. Um, so I installed a prototype of this in the East River and in the Bronx River. Um, uh, and of course, the first question that people asked when they were there is, are there fish in the East River? Um, actually, as it was installed, there's a top light that's always on, and that shifts from a warm red color when dissolved oxygen is low to a cool blue-green color when dissolved oxygen is high. And, um, and then 
Um, you can see, are there fish in the East River? Well, there's one there. Um, let's see. There's one going across the front. You can see, um, yes, there are fish in the East River. Of course there's fish in the East River. Um, and what this display actually does is transform the view of that pretty reflective surface from you know, the view of which greatly enhances your real estate value right, uh, into a representation of a habitat, a teeming habitat that's full of other organisms. Um, so you not only can see that, a, that a fish are there, you can also text the fish, and the fish will text you back, um, you know, ask them how it is down there, and, um, and similarly um, have. Um, but moreover, you, can't, you don't just text the fish, Wherever, you, wherever there's urban animals, there's always a sign, do not feed the animals. You know, at every in New York City park, there's three signs, do not feed the animals, do not feed the birds. Do you? Why not feed them? Why should we monopolize all the nutritional resources? So in, in addition to being able to, to um, text them, you can also feed them. And I've developed a food, a lure, um, that is... Um, nutritionally appropriate, right? So it's made from gelin, which is an algae derivative. So the hard edges of our urban environments can deplete the nutritional resources that are available, and we can actually, instead of feeding them, you know, Doritos or cigarette butts or chewing gum, whatever you have to hand, right? Um, they have these nutritionally appropriate foods that can actually um, allow, you know, potentially a response in the population with increased... You can imagine a busload full of kids, you know, feeding these fish um, and the population could. But in addition to being nutritionally appropriate, they have a chelating agent in them um, that is made from chitin. Um, when the fish ingest it, it binds to the bioaccumulated heavy metals and PCBs, complexes, and then passes out. They poop it out in a form that's less reactive and it settles into the silt, where it's effectively removed from bioavailability, right? What's the biggest source of mercury in our bodies? It's fish, right? So by treating their health, we're treating our own health. And this idea that we could aggregate these small interactions into collective action, into significant collective action, significant remediation of the environment, stands in radical contrast to what they're doing in the Hudson, which is dredging these so-called hotspots, these diffused um, contaminants, resuspending. It's been covered by about seven centimeters of silt, resuspending it all, reshocking the ecosystem. Whereas in this case, we are, it's like targeted drug delivery, right? You're delivering these chelation to where it's most accumulated, where it's bioaccumulated, where it's amplified in the fish that um, we depend on. So, I, you know, the, this, I had this, I think to illustrate this idea, I've had two students come to me and say, you know, I'm an environmentalist. I, I print on both sides of the paper. I ride my bike. I don't eat meat. I switch off the lights. I, but wouldn't the best thing be for me to do is to suicide. You know, then I'll, my carbon footprint will be smaller, I'll eat even less, you know. It's a logical extension of conservation and preservation, right, is to do not touch, leave no trace, do, you know, what, that you're a cost. That, and I would argue that we have to flip that into what can we do? And that we have the agency and capacity to make it good, right, to make a positive effect and so this is a small example where we might actually be able to aggregate these individual actions. And it was from the lure that I developed the Cross Species Adventure Club, which is a molecular gastronomy supper club, where I've done a lot of exploration of foods that actually measurably increase biodiversity and improve environmental health. Um, and this has been a lot of fun to do because, of, of course, food is the primary way that we interface to our... Um, uh, to natural systems, and it's a great. Um, and molecular gastronomy, which has looked at bringing science into the descriptive descriptions of, of how we transform food, um, uh, has been a... Actually, it's interesting, because I don't know how many of you are uh, into these kind of... 
what I would call a luxury food movement, the microgastronomy movement. Um, other people have criticized it as the masculinization of food. Or, you know, a lot of star chefs, all the best restaurants. It's a tool, a suite of tools that um, many chefs use to produce very expensive food, right? <laughs> and I would argue that that's uninteresting. I mean, I'm not interested in food for this, for, as luxury. I'm interested in food that actually aggregates those mouthfuls into um, effective environmental. So here's a couple of uh, this salamander cocktails um, that I mentioned before. Uh, wet kisses, um, the marshmallow for kissing a frog, formerly known as Prince. Marshmallows, of course, to rediscover the marsh in marshmallows. Um, wetlands are probably the most um, effective system for sequestering carbon. They are biodiversity hotspots. They nurseries for many marine organisms. They break down industrial contaminants. They protect aquatic ecosystems from the nutrients that, you know, the denitrification of the terrestrial ecosystem and the nitrification of the uh, aquatic ecosystem is one of the big problems. Anyway, wet, um, celebrating wetlands is something uh, I think I think that's the, you know, um, what is it? I have one word for you, my boy. Um, you remember that, what, what that one word was? In plastics, yes. <laughs> my one word would be wetlands, okay, <laughs> um, in terms of what we need. The technology of the 21st century, wet, slimy, and oozy as it is, is wetlands. But anyway, wet, back to wet kisses. Wet kisses are a marshmallow. Um, the... Um, you know, we are witnesses to the biggest species extinction crisis since the dinosaurs with the disappearance of, of amphibian species, right? Mm -hmm. The chytrid fungus is, is one of the, um, the big culprits in that. Loss of habitat um, is another one. Um, but um, the chytrid fungus, actually, if the um, organisms have on their skin microbial community this wetland bac bacteria called um, J. levidum, they, they, don't, they don't go belly up. They don't die. Um, so, uh, so wet kisses is um, cream de violette, rum agrola, uh, lime juice, Turkish pepper, and J. levidum and bilocium. So, when you um, bite into the marshmallow, your lips are inoculated with this bacteria, J. levidum, and equips you to kiss a frog and protect it from the deadly chytrid fungus. Okay. Um, Anyway, there's various other versions. Mokish delight, taste of wet landings. Um, and this sort of bio-augmenting. Oh, I'll give you one other example. of um, Water buffalo, nano water buffalo ice cream. Um, nano, because we use liquid nitrogen, it creates nano-sized crystals, which emphasizes the luxuriant creaminess of, of water buffalo milk ice cream because just high fat, high protein, it's much more delicious. As the Romans discovered a couple of thousand years ago, as, you know, in buffalo ricotta, buffalo mozzarella, much better, right? Than so um, in ice cream, it's also great. But the idea of creating nano water buffalo ice cream is that you create the desire for this incredibly delicious ice cream. That creates the demand for water buffalo. Water buffalo create the demand for wetlands. Wetlands, particularly in association with um, traditional conventional dairy, allows farmers, dairy farmers, to use that low-value um, farmland that's wet and mushy and um, actually and to extend that, to capture and intercept all the runoff from the fields because in grass-fed dairy you, use, um, you spray them with manure so that it fertilizes, but every rain event it washes down into the aquatic ecosystem. Bad for the, um, the aquatic organisms. But you intercept that with wetlands, right? So what you do by eating nano water buffalo ice cream is create a, a system that radically improves the environmental performance of dairy farms and also increases their profitability for producing this luxury item. So. I'm almost done. <laughs> I um, just wanted to finish off with, well, a couple more projects. The phenological clock is one other way that I've been exploring how we can represent these complex mutualistic relationships in our urban environment. Um, and I, uh, 
have looked at how to, to represent um, this. This is the East River phenological clock. I'm going to... Um, this is the eel cocktail party. I might just... Um, this is the glass eel cocktails. These were... Um, I'll come back to this, actually. This is why James Prosek and I have um, spent a lot of time thinking about eels. Um, anyway, uh, I'll come back to this. Um, uh, how we rethink our urban ecosystems to, in ways that represent, that we can set a, a place at the table. This is the cross-species dining table, which sets a place, in this case, um, for birds at the table. But on there is this phenological clock that I'm wanting to illustrate, which is, this is in The Hague. Um, the inner circles are perennial flowering perennials. The next set of circles are the insects, the next set of circles are the birds, and the next set of circles are the trees, right? So when something buds or blooms or migrates, it turns on. And this is marked from January through December of when, when it, it um, it occurs, right? So I would argue we can re begin to change how we represent time. You can look, oh, it's tomato time, right? <laughs> um, to represent time not as empty and nowhere, um, but as actually seasonal and dependent on organisms um, that, of course, do define our local time in a very material and real way. And phenology, when things bloom and bud um, and leaf out, is of course the most sensitive indicator of climate destabilization and shows the temporal structure of these ecosystems in ways that I think become very clear. So um, I'm going to finish off with these um, some opportunities to re-explore the wonder of flight um, with the X airport project um, and this is the paper I circulated. Actually, this is a sit different campaign, um, which I'll come back to. This is the, uh, you know, why do we work in the same way that we do in Starbucks? You know, we've, our, our computers, our cell phones have transformed. So but we still sit at the same desks and, you know, well, we could be actually sitting in wetlands watching finishing your dissertation while watching the dragonflies bounce around, right? And this is, this is where you do it in the sit different campaign. This is the heads down display, the heads way down, the heads up display, the heads uh, way down display. Very comfortable place to, to work. Um, uh, anyway, this was also about exploring how we might integrate wetlands into our urban ecosystems. Um, this is a wet landing, which I'll come back to, and a specific opportunity to, uh, with a new class of aircraft that the, aircraft, um, that the FAA has created um, called the Light Sport Aircraft. It now costs about $2,000 to get a pilot license in about a couple of weeks. Um, and these uh, Light Sport Aircraft cost about $100,000. Interesting opportunity to rethink uh, urban mobility. Um, this has... Uh, this is actually the tadpole high rise, um, which was part of looking at how uh, this, you know, the, if you put a t uh, cup underwater and you hold it up, the vacuum pressure will hold it in. It was, so these are open underneath and the tadpoles can swim up. And because there's more solar exposure, there's more photosynthesis, there's more stuff there, the, the, uh, the tadpoles seem to figure out that they could actually come up, get a view and not be attacked. Right, which was actually pretty interesting how quickly they adapted. So I've actually been making these what I call eel speed bumps or tadpole high rises um, recently to look at how this is one of them. Um, again, this has got the flotation device and the vacuum pressure so that for the eel migrations, they come, they come along, they stay near the surface, right, and they come up and down, uh, exposing themselves for our pleasure um, in the eel speed bump, but also looking at how we normally use these cloches in a Victorian museum context to exhibit dead animals, right? In this case, we're going to explore putting on non-dead animals in our urban environment. So I wanted to, these, this wet landing I um, initiated with um, uh, this 
project, here are the cloches. This was the strap-on flight simulators that I talked about where you could use your, um, these uh, biomimetic wings, use your car as a portable wind tunnel and explore the wonder of flight, angle of attack, the maneuverability. There's also a, a iPhone app that you can strap on as a strap on black box, if you will, um, that um, three axis acceleration changes are logged and so you can get your flight log to kind of regain the wonder of flight, if you will. Uh, here's some squadron training if of, of the imaginary Air Force. Anyone interested in joining the imaginary Air Force and exploring these opportunities to claim flight um, back? Um, uh, and then once you've done that, you can actually strap on these 16-foot wingspan wings and start to uh, explore your wet landings, um, reintegrating. And this is the uh, video that I circulated earlier, too, to look at how, um, to show how in um, Toronto, we actually flew hundreds of people across, uh, through downtown Toronto, across Nathan Phillips Square and past City Hall, wearing these wings, um, to explore what um, fast, cheap, radically inexpensive, emissionless urban mobility might look like, might feel like. Um, of course, you had to get your uh, strap on, you had to get your autopilot license, you had to go through a little flight training. Um, so you signed your own autopilot license as a, and um, as I mentioned, grandmothers were our most enthusiastic flyers. <laughs> But this was, this was actually, this produced a public spectacle that I call this shared public memory of a possible future. This way to get beyond bike lanes as urban transformation, the way to explore other radical possibilities. Um, this is the wing swing, also using these biomimetic wings. It's great fun. Um, and out of this, you know, the, the uh, this, um, using, Adapting this into our urban infrastructure, if we, if we upgrade our elevators, and this is a project um, with a five-story building, increasing, taking the elevators up, and our second generation um, elevators, actually about 75% more efficient. These electric vehicles are a very um, efficient way. They define our urban skylines, right? So if we take the elevators, extend their shafts 30% higher than the building, Right, you're creating a greenhouse effect or, or a glass box on the top of the building. That heats up, you vent that out. That can pull air through the building passively. Right? You get more of a free fall with your elevator because um, you know, you're going up to produce a view and then the regenerative braking means that you can tip the... the um, the elevator into becoming a micro power plant, actually producing energy for the building. Of course, this gives you access to the roof, and you can then inexpensively um, distribute goods and people. And I circulated the case study of um, Tomcat Bakery, which this is based on, this animation is based on, which um, is a, a bakery in Long Island City that has 76 trucks every morning load up and deliver fresh artisanal airy bread all over New York City. Those, um, it's directly across the road from the largest housing project in the, in the country and the children's playground concentrates that diesel grime in Long Island City. Fresh Direct, similarly, 7,000 deliveries a day, online grocers, grocery. Um, most of that diesel grime concentrated in Long Island City um, and in the lungs of residents there. We have to, you know, we have to think of a better way to distribute our food, a way that doesn't degrade our health, uh, doesn't give our children asthma, and this is certainly worth exploring. So towards this, a um, upgraded elevator that produces a view that um, gives us access to the roof, that changes, you know, the carbon foot, most of the, 60% um, in Manhattan, 60% of the energy is building related, and most of that is the HVAC system. So just by extending the elevator, we can remove that, the need for those 
system. So towards thinking about how we might, um, in an inexpensive, emissionless way, distribute goods with higher reliability and higher throughput um, is uh, one example, and one other example of how we might more radically reimagine our relationship to natural systems and seize the opportunities that our new technologies provide to explore how to produce a desirable, tasty, biodiverse future. Thank you very much.